This is Trep Wire with a special podcast, The Borrower Experience in the Time of COVID-19. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMDS, commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, Senior Managing Director, and Joe McBride, Head of CRE Finance. And joining us today are two guests, David and Tammy Goldfisher, co-founders and principals of the Henley Group, a firm that advises and advocates for borrowers and owners. With the economy reopening, the recovery has only begun, and we've seen the impact across commercial real estate, shuttered businesses, landlords facing rent shortfalls from tenants, owners requesting forbearance from lenders. In May, 19% of loans backed by hotel properties were more than 30 days past due, and the figure was 10% for retail. Many of these mortgages are packaged into CMBS, which adds layers of ownership, which makes them more complex than straight-up bank loans. Enter David and Tammy who are seeing a lot of this on the ground. Welcome. Thanks, Martha, for that introduction. And thank you, Tammy and David, for joining us. Um, You know, all you have to do is write us a really thoughtful and smart email to podcast.trep.com, and we'll have you on the next week. Um, So give us a little bit of background on the Henley Group and where you guys come from and and kind of what are you you seeing and what are you doing these days? Well, first, uh, thank you for having us on and I'm glad I uh, reached out to you last week. It it proved fruitful. Um, So the Henley Group, as Martha mentioned, is a CMBS borrower advocacy firm that represents uh, CMBS borrowers in particular when they have issues with special servicers, master servicers. So we've been in this space since 2008 Um, And we think from the last great financial recession, we've learned a few things that we can share with the listeners today um, about how to think like a servicer, uh, how to negotiate through inertia, and maybe, you know, suggest some resolutions that borrowers um, may pursue if they find themselves in either master or special servicing. Uh, My background is at corporate finance at an institutional bank. Um, worked as a startup member of an entrepreneurial bank in Boston, um, was involved in CMBS since oh, late 1990s, and co-founded the Henley Group with David in 2008. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a pleasure for us to, to be here um, and to speak with your listeners. Uh, my background um, in CMBS, I got, I got essentially my entire career has been in CMBS. I started uh, in 1995 uh, when CMBS was just getting off the ground with one of the, the early players in the industry, uh, Wells Fargo. And they were always known as one of the, you know, one of the best underwriters and really knowing how to look at real estate deals. Um, so I spent uh, several years, years at Wells Fargo in, in Washington, D.C., uh, and then I moved to New York and joined Bear Stearns, where I spent seven, year, where I spent seven years at Bear Stearns doing underwriting origination and securitization. Um, and the, the final five years as a CMBS lender uh, was at LaSalle Bank from, from 2004 until 2008, 2009 timeframe. One of the, one of the interesting things about working in in those earlier days, Wells Fargo and Bear Stearns, that has helped me tremendously and helped us tremendously in dealing with special servicers, was we would we would routinely, if, if, if many of you recall um, or are familiar with loan kicks out, loan kickouts, we would routinely have to talk to uh, BP spires and convince them and write memos that our deals made a lot of sense and the underwriting was sound. Uh, so we would constantly write memos and communicate with them when we were putting our pools together. Uh, co-founded with, uh, with Tammy, the Henley Group, um, at the beginning of the Great Recession in 2008, when we saw a great need for borrower advocacy and representation due to complicated, due to what was happening in the marketplace and knowing that there are complicated uh, pooling and servicing agreements and different interests. Thanks, guys. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned LaSalle. I was a 16-year-old intern at TREP uh, loading trustee report data from LaSalle in a DOS prompt. It was like something like LASAL, MF, you know, and then you'd have to put in the, the year and date just to load all the data. 
and printing out those remittance reports. So you brought me back. We have about, mm. with, with Manus, David, and Tammy on the phone, we have about 80 or 90 years of CMBS experience. So this is a, this is a heck of a crew, which is why I will mostly stick to asking the questions. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've been talking a lot about forbearance agreements in CMBS and the negotiations that are ongoing, especially uh, over the last few weeks as uh, May data started rolling in. Uh, what are you, give us a sense of the types of deals that you guys are working on and, and kind of trends you're seeing there. Uh, sure, happy to. Uh, so, the, the mar and the market's been speaking about this uh, a good amount. Um, and, and it seems as though a lot of borrowers that we've been, we've been talking to over, you know, and working with over the last couple months um, are getting up to speed. The, the most common thing that we're seeing here in the early days of, of response to um, you know, to this cash flow, cash flow issues that has come about from the pandemic um, is a, a, some relief that's given while a loan stays at the master servicer level. So they like to call it a performing consent. Um, the loan stays current or gets, gets back on track shortly with the ability to use um, up to three months of money in either an FF and E reserve or a lease rollover reserve, rollover reserve uh, to, to pay for principal and interest. And there's also the ability to use uh, perhaps six months of that same amount of money or, or delaying, really delaying your impounds into the capital expenditure reserve. Um, the, the, the challenges there are the special servicers are routinely requiring that borrowers pay that back pretty quickly over a six or 12 month period thereafter. And concerns in the hotel space and depending on what happens with retail, make it questionable to pro, pro forma um, that really working without borrowers coming out of pocket uh, significantly. So we're seeing, we're seeing that level um, happen at the master servicer and going much further. We are seeing some cases of a little bit further, some six month deals. Um, straight out forbearance that borrowers are getting from banks and life insurance companies in many cases, we're not seeing that in the special servicer world. And if a borrower needs to go down that path, they have to head to the special servicer and officially be transferred, which adds a lot of complication and cost. A lot of talk about um, three months may not be enough for hotels mm -hmm. to get back on their feet. If we get to June or July and um, the first three months of relief is expired at that point, what do you see happening at that point? Do you roll into another 90 day window or do you see something more severe happening to the borrower at that point? You know, many deals will have, um, many deals won't have much more money than three months worth in their capital expenditure or FF&E account. So that sort of says it right there. If, they're, if, if they have no more money there and the borrower had a problem March, April, May and couldn't make the payments, they're likely gonna then default and move over to the special servicer. Uh, so in some case it becomes inevitable and it's really just, you know, kicking the can a few months and tapping, you know, and tapping the reserve. So you really haven't seen any true forbearance, right? That's, that's just confirming that it's, it's mostly just been, you can cover P and I out of reserve accounts where you weren't allowed to before. And that's kind of the relief that's being offered at the master yeah. servicer level. Yeah. I think there are a few examples um, in the industry of, of true, what I call true forbearance. Um, but very few and, and unique circumstances. Um, a few deals that might have had problems and, and defaulted pre-COVID. Um, and then COVID happened. There was already communication and discussion going on. Um, and I think a lot of other, other deals are being talked about right now at the special servicer level. So the deal officially transferred and longer term in many cases forbearance is being, is being discussed. And the jury's out as to how the specials are going to respond to that largely. Right. right. So in your, I guess in this time, but also I guess in, in your previous history when you had a lot of business, which I'm sure that's happening right now too, which is, which is great for you guys. Uh, what kind of makes a borrower successful versus unsuccessful in their negotiations with a master or a special? 
Um, well, one of the things that's always been important for us to communicate to a borrower and that, and that we want to present to a special servicer um, is transparency and, and credibility. I mean, the, the, the kiss of death in, in special servicing for a borrower is if your asset manager um, at one of the special servicing firms doesn't trust what you're doing. So transparency, providing the information when they ask for it, um, and, and credibility and showing the value that, that the borrower, you know, brings to the table um, becomes, you know, becomes extremely important. And in this, in this day, in this time with COVID, what we're encouraging borrowers to do um, and how we're framing up a lot of our asks because this, you know, the, the, the masters and the specials are very, are very fast to say, okay, what, what's your ask? You know, I, I, I don't know how many borrowers they've reached out to in the early days and say, give us these five things and, and give us your ask. And the borrowers just say, oh, here, here's the ask. Um, so we see a lot of those after the fact if they, you know, if they contact us and some of those have gotten turned down. Um, I think that we're in the, in, the, in the COVID response, we are making sure that the asks we're putting forth are developed to be um, commensurate with what's going on at the property and what the cash flow looks like over the last, over the next 12, you know, an F12 instead of a T12, you know, what it looks like. And hotel borrowers quickly say, well, how do I know where it's going to be? And, and we have to, you know, we have to, they have to put forth the best they can. So the ask has to be, has to line up. How does that, um, you know, the difference between 2008 and today in 2008, it was kind of a slow motion train wreck, if you will, right? There was a certain percentage of loans going into special servicing every month, but it wasn't this, um, you know, zero to 60 in 2.5 seconds type mm -hmm. of move. Um, how does it differ now in terms of the, the servicer and special servicer being able to handle things in such a tight time frame? Uh, and does that lead to a lot more inefficiency than perhaps you saw 10 years ago? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's certainly leading, you know, to some inefficiencies, um, you know, and, and the response time, sometimes it's just weeks and weeks and weeks can go by uh, without borrowers getting, you know, getting response. I mean, we're, we're, we're fielding new calls with borrowers now where they're, they're telling us that they put in some stuff and got a, or an ask in, if you will, um, two months ago, a month and a half ago, and they haven't heard anything since. So I think in, in, in some cases, you know, it's, um, they're overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed, certainly. I think they're, I think they're, they're working hard at it. Um, and they're, you know, they're trying to keep up with it. But I, I think a lot of servicers are overwhelmed. And when you look at things by property type, you know, how does it differ in terms of success ratios, um, time to get in front of the servicer or special servicer, time to get a response? You know, it seems like anything hotel related would, would seem to be more, to be trickier, um, more complex and maybe an office less complex. Maybe you can comment on, uh, on how that looks. Yeah, um, I would say you're right in that the hotels are complicated in that hotel, you know, occupancy is going to rely on consumer patterns, which we don't know how are those going to play out. Um, we do know from, you know, various analytical tools, what hotels are expected to return online, you know, sooner than later, drive to hotels, um, what will be last? Well, weddings, big group events, et cetera. So, you know, there's some guidance out there in terms of doing your pro forma so that, so that you have a reasonable chance of, of being close to some actuality. But most cases, the, the, the clients have to do, and as the appraisers are doing to value these things, they're doing three different sensitivity analysis. So they have to do, um, you know, worst case through best case, and um, they still may be far off. So that's important that it's going to be a dynamic conversation with the servicer because things may not go exactly as any borrower thinks they will. And office is, um, as you mentioned, just because by nature of the longer term leases generally has a lag period where we will see um, the delinquency pile up maybe if it's going to happen 
a few years from now. So the fact that you see pro formas from, um, you know, various borrowers puts you a little bit in the catbird seat in terms of what people are thinking. You know, given that insight and given what you're seeing going forward, you know, what kind of confidence do you have that we might be seeing a V-shaped recovery or something that's a little bit more L-shaped? Do the tells that the borrowers are, are putting forth in the pro formas, pro formas give you any sense one way or the other of, of how much confidence there is in the borrower market? Well, I think, Manis, um, I don't know if you're an L-shaped guy or a V-shaped guy yourself, but um, I'm leaning toward the l shape. And I'm leaning toward that because one, it, it's in alignment with, with what the borrowers need to show the servicers. You do not want to show a case that's too rosy of a picture and hence your ability to get any relief will be uh, less than if you're showing data-driven. It has to be data-driven and you know, not to give a shameless plug for TREP, but we're big fans of TREP. We're on it every day, um, all day. Using, using all the resources, individual CMBS loans, whole asset classes of data. And those, that kind of data is definitely being used in the proposals that we're putting together to send to the servicers. If my daughters were to tell me what kind of guy I was, they would say I'm an L-shaped guy. And it's from that thing they put up on their forehead, you yeah. know, the, uh, <laughs> the loser symbol when, when I tell them they can't go out, uh, you know, past curfew. So, that's that's what we call bad radio. That's what we call bad radio. But if you can picture the L shape on the forehead, that's what my, I can, my daughters I can. would tell. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe I, I just want to confirm that thing about the L shape thing with Manus, just from my own experiences. Um, <laughs> so, w moving on. So, you know, I guess Manus kind of asked this, but would you say, are there any parallel? I mean, it's hard, probably hard to, to draw this now, but are there parallels to some of the experiences that you had the last time around during the last great financial crisis uh, in terms of what you're seeing, you know, the type of work you're doing, who you're working with? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, I think there are. I mean, I, I think the, play, the, the special servicing play, playbook um, is is going to be largely the same where they're assigning an asset manager. They're looking at every deal and sizing up their response to every deal, you know, individually. I think, you know, I think that there are some interesting differences, right, between the last cycle and, and this cycle. And some of the, uh, some of the big challenges that existed, um, as deals were being worked through in the 2012, 13, 14, 15 years, um, you know, su such as such as um, the ability for special servicers to really delay things for a while, and and often those often those delays were um, were pushed forth by perhaps some controlling bondholders that didn't want to see their position wiped out. So I think some good changes were made um, through the industry coming out of, you know, a lot of work was done for many years and, and, and coming out of that cycle into CMBS 2.0, a lot of, you know, the mark to market has, you know, has been in, introduced and that should, that should improve because, you know, a delayed, a delayed uh, resolution in, you know, in, in a workout is, um, is often, not the right path to go down. You know, your best deal is, is supposed to be your first deal. Um, so I think that, I think hopefully that will improve upon things and make it more of a level playing ground and the borrowers will have a reasonable opportunity with a reasonable deal to put forth um, a resolution to keep their asset. Um, so I think that's a, you know, that's hopefully a difference, you know, from the last cycle. Um, you know, the, the fee, you know, the, the fee driving that you hear about, uh, borrowers are really concerned about too many fees in special servicing um, and special servicers, you know, are known for asking for, for fees in a, you know, in a workout scenario. Here in a market where cash flow is significantly impacted, I mean, hotels go, go from, you know, positive debt service coverage to not even be able to pay their operating expenses. And, 
you know, we recently saw a term sheet um, from a special servicer for, you know, I, I call it a, forbear a, a true forbearance deal um, and wanted a significant fee. And it's, ch it's, 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 cha it's a challenging uh, pill for a borrower to swallow um, when, when those fees are being asked for in a, you know, in that kind of a, um, you know, in, in this kind of an environment. So I think that concern is there. I think they have a business to run and they're certainly in, entitled to, um, get fees. So I think, I think that's something to be watched. And do you see a lot of differentiation from servicer to servicer and special servicer to special servicer in terms of how you would advise your clients uh, to put forth their proposals and go go about their uh, their ask. Yeah, we do, and we do see differences with with specials. Um, you know, without getting into you know too many specifics, um, we see differences between w what I consider to be you know more independent special servicers uh, versus ones that are other ones that are you know a little more dialed into. Um, other aspects of the market, um, BPs, buyers, and, you know, and so there tends to be more um, potential for, you know, for conflict there. I saw Tammy, you, you were uh, raising your hand there. This is another example of bad radio. Did you have <laughs> something to, to chime in there? Well, yeah, I was going to say that another big change i think that is is really a plus for the borrowers in this round versus the the great recession was the um virtual elimination of the fair value option um where borrowers could lose a property even perhaps if they had a very good proposal and their net present value um you know was amongst the highest that the servicer had received there was an ability for the um, CCR the controlling class rep to purchase that property working through servicing. So there are a lot of borrowers we talk to that when they head into servicing, they have a bit of a doomsday attitude thinking that their property is going to get pulled out from under them. And I just, I think that since that fair value, value option has been virtually done away with in the in, in CMBS 2.0 and, and on, that concern has been alleviated. So Feel free kind of, to uh, you know, punt on this question because this might be uh, too close to the bone, but in mm -hmm. the retail space, um, you know, the assumption was for a lot of these properties, the borrower is holding a, a free option, right? They were cash flow positive um, and they were gonna hold on to the property until they reached their maturity date because why not? I could put a little bit of cash in my pocket as long as I'm not remitting all cash to pay down principal. But even if I am, it's a Hail Mary that maybe this property turns around or somehow bricks and mortar becomes um, you know, less painful. And now the thesis is a lot of the defaults that might not have come until 2023 or 2024 might come a lot quicker because borrowers are now modestly cash flow negative or maybe seriously into cash flow negative the optionality is gone and they say, here are the keys, um, you know, let's be done. Have you seen any sentiment change among your uh, retail borrowers that you deal with? And, and what is the, the tenor of, of that part of the market? Uh, we deal a lot with retail borrowers and you're, you're right that there were chinks in the armor long before COVID, um, which just exacerbated the velocity of the situation. Um, and, you know, with e-commerce sales in 2019 at a 16% penetration and having gone up from, you know, the last 10 years when it was 6%, that's not going away anytime soon. So retailers have a real problem. Um, we haven't seen the retailers we've been working with necessarily ready to hand it in the keys, but I think the, the thought is what, if any, relief can they get? And there will be winners and losers. And the borrowers um, that ha are cap well capitalized, bring some value to the table, um, have some staying power. Those are the ones that I think will end up main holding their properties. However, you know, in my mind, I, I virtually think that, you know, malls are dead, you know. So those things are gonna be repurposed, 
um, could be, you know, ground up in a lot of instances. Um, I feel like there's a big gap between, um, I almost feel like the middleman has been cut out, meaning like the, the J.C. Penney, the, the Macy's, uh, Sears, what retail is doing well, uh, Target, Walmart, some of the value providers, and then you have, you know, some of the uh, experiential retail, that that's going to really um, be critical in 2020. Retailers have a lot of business planning to do and a lot of thought that has to go into these next few years to keep up with, um, you know, the various crises that they're facing. And I think, I think they, I think there's a, I think there's a lot there and there's a lot that will unravel. Given where you sit, you know, again, speaking from the, the catbird seat, do you have other people coming to you with basically no idea, uh, maybe not even borrowers as to what the market looks like coming to you saying, you know, what are your borrowers saying in terms of what occupancy will look like in aggregate in the Southeast, in the Southwest, in the Pacific Northwest, in aggregate, are you in a position to consult to like banks and say, you know, to their model builders, um, you know, in aggregate without talking about a specific borrower, um, you know, here's what we're seeing in the future and here's what we think a, a modest mid case could be, or is there just not enough data at this point to, to really make broad uh, assumptions on, on where we're headed? For, for, for me, um, we have glimpses of it in various markets with various types of retail projects. As I said, I think that's why I feel the mall, having seen that across the country as an asset class, is, um, you know, is, is going by the boards. In terms of real hard analytics, I would probably leave that to um, someone in that field in terms of putting that together with any ability to really have enough volume and regression modeling to, to know how that should, should, should play out, especially if anyone's counting on the advice. <laughs> you, can, you can leave that to us, okay. Tammy. <laughs> um, I'm sure that our, our last guests, Katie and Dan, are very happy to hear Tammy say that the mall is dead. Uh, mm -hmm. It's the same thesis that they have. So our guests are backing each other up, which is good. Oh. Maybe we'll, we'll have to have you know, a, a retail optimist on here uh, although we had Jan, who was who was relatively optimistic uh, on the consumer, but I, I don't know about malls in general. He was a um, V-shaped guy. He's a V-shaped guy, right? He might not have uh, had daughters. <laughs> um, so you know, Tammy, you you mentioned before how you know the fair value option in CMS 2.0 is virtually gone. You know, coming out of this crazy, unprecedented time, do you guys have any? Um, predictions on any sort of structural changes or, or rule changes or anything, you know, in CMBS land? I know, I know the operating advisor came out of the last recession. Are there other things that you would assume uh, might come out of this? Um, you know, I, I, I guess I, I can take a step at that. I mean, certainly the, the obvious one that comes to my mind is empowering the master servicer um, a little bit more. Uh, it, you know, it just seems to me that a lot of the, um, the, the, the human capital has been, you know, has been wasted and a lot of time has been wasted by this, you know, this back and forth with mass between master and special on um, something that, you know, should be a little bit more routine. Um, so I'd like to see a lot more come into the hands of the master servicer to handle things if it's not going to be an impact to um, you know, to the bondholders, the, you know, the, the, the challenges, the special servicers and the, the bottom bondholders, the way the structure is set up, uh, the BP spires, the control, the control guys, because the control guys are involved in, in, even in these master servicer performing consents, the control guys sign off. The master goes to the special and the special will get sign off from the, you know, from the control guy, which is the bottom, you know, the bottom bondholder. They want to have their, they want to have their hands in there on these things. So I think there's going to be pushback um, with, with that kind of significant change, any kind of significant change there to the uh, pooling and servicing agreement. Um, you know, that's one place. So, you know, it gets kind of a great segue into the next uh, idea 
you know, we, we see news stories, especially uh, when things go, go wrong, that, you know, see it, being a borrower in CMBS is, is tough and rough and special servicers are, are terrible and hard to deal with and all these other kind of stories. Is that, is that how you see the world or do you, do you think that's kind of overblown? You know, it's, um, there, are, there are definite challenges uh, in, in dealing in, in special servicing. And I think from a borrower's standpoint, they, you know, like for example, we, we routinely have to tell a borrower when, you know, when a loan goes into default and is in default and that's ongoing, they, they, they talk about the reserves. Let's say there's a half a million dollars in an FF&E reserve. They call it theirs. They said, that's my reserve money. And while it is, while it is there for them to access, they, they don't understand or need to be constantly reminded that it's the, it's the lender's collateral and the loan is not performing, the loan's in default. Um, so I think it's, I think it's a little bit of, of understanding, you know, of each other's, of each other's cases. Um, and I think both sides could really do a better job, you know, in, in understanding. I think I'm digressing a little bit from the, from the question. I think they have to do, I think, I think they can do a better job of understanding each other. I think you get, you know, it's very rewarding for us when we get a, we get good dialogue going with an asset manager that is really digging in and understanding the real estate. And again, you know, I think back to, you know, my early days in training um, at Wells Fargo and at Bear Stearns, and we would get in and we would really underwrite the real estate. We'd really understand everything about the real estate because if you go into credit committee and you couldn't answer the right question, the book would be thrown at you and, you know, you didn't get your deal approved. So when a, when a special servicer is digging in and really understanding the asset, they, they, uh, they, 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 there's a dialogue there and then they can pitch a story to their committee and maybe they can get something done that is actually the highest and, and highest present value, net present value for, um, for the bondholders. And it, and, it's, and it becomes a win for everybody. So those are rewarding situations. But I think even in this environment, it becomes, it becomes even more challenging because these guys are completely inundated with, with deals. I had, an, I had an asset manager tell me recently that he had 50 deals on his, on his plate. It's too many. It's right. way too many. Right. So I'd encourage more, more of that. Well, you know, and then taking the other side, um, are there things that you see borrowers consistently messing up or lacking uh, in terms of, you know, how they're negotiating, how they're communicating, or, you know, what they're presenting, anything like that? Yeah, I mean, think about pre-COVID, the de delinquency rate was about 2%. So most borrowers were paying P&I year after year like clockwork um, and just remitting payments and doing what they were supposed to be doing. Why would they know, you know, it stand to reason that they wouldn't know how to deal with, negotiate with, or succeed with a servicer? Most, most of them have never been in, in, in this position. So I think that, um, you know, one big no-no is um, fishing for a solution or seeking advice or business plan from the servicer casting out your line and saying, well, what could you do for me? That's just, that is not going to be, um, that response is not coming. Uh, so you have to be proactive. You have to have a narrative and a uh, performer and historicals, and you have to have your ducks in a row in terms of what is your case. What is your case? Why do you need it? And really anticipate the objections the servicer is going to have. I look at it like if I owed somebody a dollar and I was willing and, and, and I was only going to pay them back 50 cents, how quickly am I going to call that person, right? I mean... <laughs> It's, it's that sort of thing where you are, as a borrower, have to convince the servicer that 
your relief is warranted. And the only way you can do that is through real data. Um, so I think that's a big one. Really have data driven modeling that positions you, the borrower, as the best possible solution. Be the solution, not the problem. Um, what of value as a borrower can you bring to the table? It's a two way street. It may not be capital, but it may be other resources. You may be a great operator, and that's a good thing to really highlight why the property needs that particular operator. Um, so I think, I think that's just important when you present your proposal that it comes from you and it's very well detailed and you've thought it through. We see um, on the remittance comments, either special servicing or watch list, and, and we had a servicer um, tell us this, that you see the term canceled used frequently in the servicer watch list notes. And, and one of the major servicers told us that about 15% of their book has fallen into this category. And I asked, you know, what does canceled mean? Is that really rejected or is it withdrawn? And um, this person said it, it's withdrawn sometimes and it's canceled and it's uh, rejected sometimes. My question to you is when you see something withdrawn, is that kind of because the paperwork is not ready and they're going to come back later and people should assume that this is a forbearance waiting to happen or is it a case more of i think i can muddle through and this is going to turn out okay you you're talking about covid yeah covid cancellations COVID. where you know i mean i i think it's the latter i think the bar thinks they can muddle through and they don't want to once they take a get a sniff of what it costs to you know borrow from their own 401k and then pay it back shortly thereafter um, and pay some legal fees and pay some servicing you know fees they just say you know forget it let's just let's just see if we can figure out how to get through so i think it then depends on what what happens in three months if it's a hotel property hope maybe they're hoping things come back um, and if it's a retail property they're really hoping that their tenants don't go bankrupt and stay in the property and can pay rent so I think it's, I think it's borrower truly withdrawing. So Tammy's response brought up two, two uh, anecdotes in my brain. One was I had a manager once, she happens to be on this call and she uh, <laughs> told me that you don't, well, anytime you go and talk to your manager, you don't bring them problems, you bring them solutions, right? So if you do have a problem, at least have a potential way of fixing it at the ready to suggest. I think that's kind of what you're talking about, Tammy. And then I thought about the dollar and the 50 cents story. And I thought of the Bronx tale, uh, you know, where what's his name? Cologino, the guy owes him 20 bucks and he's chasing after him. And they tell him, listen, man, do you like that guy? Is he your friend? No, you just paid 20 bucks to never see him again. <laughs> Not really totally relevant, but just the musings of a, of a weird 31 yeah. year old. Here. That that's a good investment, right? You got rid of them for twenty bucks. <laughs> right, right, exactly, right. Um, so I guess you know, just to wrap things up, or anything else, you know, that we didn't touch on. Any themes you're seeing in the market right now? Any any expectations? Any uh, macroeconomic expectations from the Henley Group on how long this thing is going to last? Um, you know, I just getting back to the L and, and the V. Um, I didn't really comment on that. You know, I I, I tend to, you know, I tend to agree. Uh, with, with Tammy and with Manus's daughters, that uh, it, it's going to be, it's going to be more L-shaped. I mean, I, I think you'll certainly see different, um, different versions of that um, for the different property types, and I look forward to seeing a nice, colorful um, trep, you know, chart that is going to come out and pop up on my screen and, and be live the way it, you know, the way you guys do that. Um, but I, you know, I think that you'll see. You'll see it more L in, in hotels. Um, and I think you, I don't know what the shape is for office. You know, I think we're going to see a lot of office problems coming into, you know, 21 and 22. I think you're going to see, you know, I think you're going to see some more issues there. Um, but I don't know if it's going to be as severe, you know, as, as, the big, as what we're seeing here with, um, you know, hotel and, and retail. Well, we said a, a couple of weeks ago that, for the first time in really a decade, other than in Houston or, or, or other oil patches, credit is really important now with office tenants more so than ever before. So 
it's a real dynamic change for uh, where we've been at least since 2010. Yeah, I would say that, uh, especially in the retail, credit tenants are key. Um, the ones, again, that are the resourced, they're using technology, creativity, um, they have capital, and there's some lease term. That's probably the income stream that you can count on. Um, it, it's difficult with, with um, you know, non-credit tenants for any lender, it's going to be tough for them to underwrite those. So how are some of these CMBS loans getting refinanced down the road? Um, should be interesting. Right. Well, thank you guys. That was great. Martha? With that, we'll close the special podcast. Thanks to our guests, David and Tammy Goldfisher of the Henley Group. Thanks to our producer, Keegan St. Ange Join us later this week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question, send us an email at podcast at trip.com or look for our Twitter poll for topics. I saw that today. Until then, visit trip.com for more info and subscribe to the Tripwire podcast with your favorite.